foot. Fred? You don't want to know what I've just seen. It's Mountain Devil. <laughs> Mountain Devil! You've been having too much of this moonshine. You want a little snow? What do they look like, Fred? They have horns. Was it a boy or a girl, Fred? <laughs> Blasted it. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> The animal fell into a ravine. Its body was never recovered. The miners slept off the events of their day. It's a far-fetched story. Men attacked and even injured by irate giant apes in the USA. Yet it was taken seriously, reported on the front page of the state newspaper, alongside the world news. Could there really be a giant ape living in North America? Well, since Beck's encounter, Bigfoot has grown to be big news. But there's still no body, no skin and bones. And this is Bigfoot country. These remote forests run all the way from Alaska to California. 55,000 square kilometers of incredibly productive habitat. You know, I've never seen anywhere quite so unspoiled and fertile. Not much goes hungry here. And it was once the happy hunting ground of the Quagil Indians. Their name for Bigfoot was Bukwus. The Bukwus is not really mythical. It's an actual being that's taller than a man, covered in hair. And they talk when they used to live out here about picking berries, and a Bukwus would be on the other side of the berry patch picking too. You don't see them very much, but they're out there. What do they live on? How do they coexist with deer, bears, all of the other known animals of this region? They live on a lot of plant life, fruit and vegetables, seafood, clams and so forth. But they are known to harvest deer and to harvest salmon as well in the rivers. How often are they seen? I mean, are they seen every year? I live out here six months of the year, every year, for the last five or six years. And you're lucky to hear of a story once every three or four years. So they're very rare. But like our legends say, they live in an invisible house deep in the forest. And that's why we can't find them. And they're also nocturnal. They're out at night harvesting their foods. And that is interesting. No nocturnal apes are yet known to science. They haven't got good enough night vision. But for Tom Seward here, the legend is backed up by an encounter. In 1993, I went into an anchorage behind my ancestral village with my three crew. And just after dark, we heard whistling coming from the shore. And we hit the switch on the spotlight, and there it was, a male and a female. And she automatically dropped into a fetal position. And the male, at the same time, dropped down to his knees and brought his arm up in front of his face. And you could see the reflection of his eyes, the green reflection from the spotlight. And they just stayed there. For 15 or 20 minutes, I had the spotlight on them, and they froze. They did not move. What I saw on that beach that night was there was no way it would have been a black or a grizzly bear. I've seen blacks and grizzlies stand. No way could anyone ever say this is a bear to me, because I knew what I saw. It was definitely a book west walking across the beach. 
Tom's animal is a potent symbol, a rich subject for a professional storyteller like him. And this culture stretches back hundreds of years, which is also strange because here in North America there's no fossil evidence for any ape species except man. Book Wuss, Bigfoot, doesn't have a history. So does it have a family, a mate, siblings, offspring? All species have to exist in populations. What would such a population of apes need? Well, taking mountain gorillas as an example, they need food and enough space to harvest it. These groups need ranges of up to 30 square kilometers. There are around 600 mountain gorillas. They're critically endangered and live in small pockets high in the jungles. They were discovered way back in 1902, and these days we know every individual. So it seems that even the shyest, the most remote populations of apes, have trouble hiding from science. How often do people come across Bigfoot? A fellow called John Green has logged over 3,000 encounters in the last 30 years. And one, clearly the most remarkable, comes with a piece of film. You may have already seen it. It was shot by the late Roger Patterson and his mate Bob Gimlin in California in October of 1967. And sitting here watching it with John is pretty remarkable. He knew these guys. This is the start of the roll that they eventually got the picture of the creature on, yes. They're just riding their horses up the bed of Bluff Creek. Is that well, usually you're, uh, you'll be seeing Bob Gilman because Patterson did most of the shooting. He's been making this film for some time. Was he much of a cameraman? Strictly amateur. There's, there's Bob now with Packworth. By any standards, it's a bit of a movie, but then, with just a minute left on the film, it changes dramatically. So this was taken immediately after they saw it. Yeah. As soon as Rod got off horse, he got the camera out, yeah. Whatever your first impression of this footage, there's no in-camera trickery. We've examined the original, and something really walked in front of Patterson's camera. And let's be clear about one thing. This footage either has to be a hoax, or the most important piece of wildlife film ever. That's the footage. Here's the story that goes with it. It was around 1 p.m. on October the 20th, 1967. Patterson and Gimlin were riding north up Bluff Creek in California. They rounded a bend and saw the creature. Patterson pulled the camera from his saddlebag and began filming. After about 11 seconds, he began to run closer, and as he did, Bob rode closer still to within 20 meters of the creature. He covered Roger with his rifle until the subject walked away. We got it! Using the latest computer technology, we've stabilised the film so it's easier to see. Now, you might think it looks like a man in a suit, but so would the legendary Bigfoot. The question is, which is it? From what we can see, the fur is pretty convincing. It flows correctly down the back, and you can apparently see muscles moving under the skin. But would any shy, wild animal react to the arrival of two strange, excited men on horseback by just strolling away with a single glance back? For me, its behaviour is definitely odd. Footage is one thing. The creature left traces, and to substantiate the film, there were footprints in the sand. Incredibly, they were deeper than the ones left by Bob's horse. Each hoof would put down a weight of 400 kilos but the depth of these prints suggests the creature was even heavier. Yet the average weight for a six-foot male gorilla is only 180 kilos. Roger reloaded his Kodak and filmed them. Then they took plaster casts, some measured 37 centimetres long. And this is one of them. 
So are these here the remainder of the cast that he made? Because they're very different, and they're, they're obviously made by the same animal in the same place at the same time. That's right. Th this probably represents the actual shape of the foot fairly closely, but sometimes the action of the foot makes a very different shape. Uh, this is another one that has a very strange shape. It, uh, in fact, it is just the way that heel drove in and then shifted the weight up to the front. The impressions are good, very natural, but their depth suggests the creature was far heavier than a gorilla the same size. So could these critically corroborative footprints be fakes? The Patterson film is at the nub of the whole Bigfoot phenomena. It's kept it alive for the last 30 years. And its strength lies in the fact that it's real film and it's combined with actual artifacts, the footprints. The problem is that you never see the creature on the creature film make a footprint. And the film of the footprints disappeared immediately after it was first shown. And that is a problem. So where can I find out more about Bigfoot as an animal? Where is there any biology to support the legend? These forests stretch all the way down the Pacific coast and John Green investigated many stories here in the 60s and 70s. Now he pointed me towards Oregon, to a specific ridge near a place called Estacata. It was here in the winter of 67 that Glenn Thomas says he saw three Bigfoot and they were doing something special. They were actually foraging. He watched them digging in the rock scree apparently hunting for hibernating rodents. But some of these rocks weigh 70 kilograms. So would it be profitable to move all of this for a mere snack of squirrels? It doesn't make any energetic sense at all. But the stories didn't stop in the 60s. Detailed reports are still coming in. Mike McDonald is a bear hunter from British Columbia. Yeah, I came to this spot right here in this valley in um, May of 1997, and I was watching the river bottom, and uh, I put up my binoculars and spotted a brown bear sitting exactly across from me on the other side of the river. It had its rear end to me, so it was feeding, and I thought, okay, I've got lots of time, and I watched it for a little bit with the binoculars, and uh, I realized I better get set up here for a shot, so I put, brought my gun up, put the crosshairs on its back end, and I continued to watch it through my rifle scope. When it did stand up, I was absolutely blown away. It didn't have the shape of a black bear anymore. It, it looked uh, more human or, or even ape-like. And I still was sort of watching it to see why this bear looks so strange. And it started pulling down some of the branches around it with its paws or hands and eating the leaves off of the trees just above it. And from this distance, about 150 or 200 yards, I wasn't convinced of what it was, but I was convinced it wasn't a bear. The facial features were very human-like, um, but at the same time, different from ours. And uh, I didn't know what to do. I sat here for about another five or six, maybe seven minutes um, watching and just in awe of this thing and realized my camera was in the truck and my truck was about 100 or 200 yards up the hill from me. And sadly, that's typical. No photograph. With thousands of documented sightings, there's not a single snap of Bigfoot. The biggest Bigfoot event of all was recorded near Bosberg on the Canadian border. A total of 1,089 footprints were found trodden into mud and snow. They cross a 1.1 metre high fence without a break in stride. The tracks appear to be of a very long-legged creature, 
but curiously also a crippled one. Its right foot had twisted toes and displaced bones, something that would be unusual, but at the same time very natural. At Washington State University, primate anatomist and Bigfoot author Dr. Grover Krantz has studied the bone positions in meticulous detail. A human foot expanded to this length would have the bulges about here. This means the heel was relatively longer and the forefoot relatively shorter, which is just exactly the leverage required for a walking biped of about eight feet or two and a half meters tall. That's some quite complex aspects of anatomy there. Do you think that any hoax or anywhere would be up to reproducing those? If any hoaxer were to do uh, this sort of trick, he would have had to figure out everything from zero, whereas I saw the tracks and figured it out. He would have had to know human anatomy, foot anatomy very thoroughly. He would have to know the effects of absolute size on how the strength increases but the weight increases faster, how the leverage has to change, how a diseased foot would have to bulge out to the side of the corresponding parts. In other words, he has to be a better anatomist and a more clever, inventive person than I am. And I don't think anybody like that has existed since Leonardo da Vinci. In fact, a proven Bigfoot hoaxer lives very close to Bosberg. I can't explain all of these accounts, but they don't fuse into any framework of biological possibility that Bigfoot could exist as a real animal. So what about the crucial Patterson footage? What biology does it contain? John Green was the first to investigate it. He reconstructed the event just nine months later. This is Jim McLaren, six foot five tall, walking the same route as the Bigfoot. He'd been to Bluff Creek when the tracks were still plainly to be seen, so he knew the route it took. With a digital effects device, we can precisely match the two separate pieces of film and show that the creature was only a bit taller than McLaren and a little bulkier. But the footprint suggests that it was at least four times as heavy. The movement has always been controversial as well. Grover Krantz thinks the gait of the creature is definitely inhuman. The Patterson creature walks leaning forward somewhat and bends its knees most of the time so that when it takes a step, it supports the leg with a bent knee and keeps two feet on the ground for an unusual length of time. It also lifts the foot very high behind each step, like so. In addition uh, to all those things, it also swings the arms, which is very difficult to imitate like this. And this is something I can do only for a short period of time, but the Patterson subject did it for at least 300 feet, and I don't think anyone could be trained to do that. Personally, I'm not so sure. Grover himself just did his version of the walk for 30 feet. With 10 times the practice, maybe someone could walk 10 times further. Whatever, everything Bigfoot leads to Patterson and to Bluff Creek so I decided to pay homage to the site. 31 years later, it's all steep valleys, rocky creek beds, and certainly nothing that looks like the area where the film was shot. But in 1964, there'd been a massive flood, and it had ripped out all of the scrub and deposited lots of sandbars here, and for once, it had created a window of opportunity for someone to see a mysterious creature or to pull off a fabulous hoax. If this was a hoax, it was a good one, which means it would have to have been well executed. So, what are the options? Well, in option one, both Roger and Bob are innocent. They were hoaxed by a separate party in a suit. Frankly, it's unlikely. How could the hoaxer be sure of meeting them out there in the wilderness and also guarantee not to get shot? Both men were armed, and remember, only a body will ever satisfy science. Option two. Roger and Bob could have set the whole thing up themselves, built the suit, the lot. Well, Roger was a pretty resourceful guy. He could turn his hand to quite a few things, and so could Bob. But that suit is too good. It's not an amateur effort. 
more likely the product of a professional special effects designer. Option three has a third man involved, someone who employed Roger to film the creature, use a part exposed roll of film and bring Bob along as an essential second witness. It would easily have been worth their while. After the film was shown, a TV company in Los Angeles offered Patterson $50,000. A modern equivalent would stand closer to a quarter of a million. So this option has Roger leading on an innocent Bob, and Roger was firmly in control. They'd even conspicuously agreed not to shoot at the creature unless it turned an attack. Bob Gimlin doesn't talk Bigfoot anymore these days, but in 1992, he spoke on tape to John Green. This particular day that, uh, that we got the film footage, uh, we uh, well starting out early in the morning. I left early in the morning, and of course Roger slept in, and my horse loosened his shoe up, so I come back in to, to uh, tack the shoe on tighter, and Roger was gone when I got back. and. Uh, so, Roger and Bob were apart on the morning before the film was made. I had covered that morning and I told him, and he said, well, why don't we ride up uh, in this area that we had ridden? And then Roger led Bob right to the spot. It's a suspicious detail, but Bob still maintained that what he saw was an animal. He hasn't spoken to the media for 13 years, but he is the crucial eyewitness. Hi, Bob. This is Chris Packham, and I work for the BBC Natural History Unit in Bristol, England. At the moment, we're making... Surprisingly, Bob was quite approachable, happy to tell his story. When I first saw this thing, it was just like the, the adrenaline flu, you know. I mean, I was, I was shocked, excited, uh, just like Ollie, then they do exist, you know. It was a fascinating call, but there was one big question. Do you still think that what you saw was an animal? Well, I've thought about this many, many times over the years. At one time in my life, right shortly after the film footage, I was totally convinced that no one could fool me. And of course, I'm an older man now and I see a lot of things and I think there could have been a possibility, but it would have had to have been really well planned by Roger. And I feel that they would have had to have been very, very careful because I had a 30 6 loaded with 180 grain bullets and had that thing have turned and rushed me, I would have shot it. So I feel that if that was a hoax, somebody was taking an awful big chance with their life. So maybe that's the answer to why the creature just walked away. Maybe it was a brilliant idea casting Bob as a perfectly innocent eyewitness. There's one thing left to do. Look for the third man. First stop, that suit. In Burbank, California, Optic Nerve Studios specialize in building fantastical animals around actors with astonishing results. It's run by John Vulich. In my mind, it's undoubtedly a suit. Um, uh, just, it has all the earmarks of being a guy in a suit. Generally, what we would build is a two-layered suit. We would have a musculature underneath where the muscles are actually separate pieces sewn together so they can slide up against each other the way muscles would on a real person. And then on top of that, the fur suit goes on as a separate layer. So we get some kind of sliding in between the fur and the, and the muscles that does tend to look more natural. What about the locomotion? Do you think it looks like a guy walking along or is there something more to it? To my mind, the movements uh, of this creature are, are nowhere near as dramatically different as a man playing a gorilla or a chimpanzee. You're talking about very, very different body language, very different style. And so if a human being can master that type of movement, he can certainly master this that much easier. And I think an amateur would be able to uh, achieve this kind of locomotion very easily. It's 1967. Could a suit of this quality have been made then? And if so, by whom? Um, there's been rumors... Um, in the industry for years, the John Chambers who had built the suits for Planet of the Apes and in fact was doing Planet of the Apes at the time that this uh, footage was shot, um, had built the suit. None of it's been substantiated, but it's been a rumors that have been persistent for years. So if the suit was off the peg and the movement's not so strange after all, let's get the camera Patterson used, find an amateur operator and recreate exactly to the inch the action at Bluff Creek. 
this is our creature's starting point. All we've got to do is measure out 112 feet down here to where it's found on the first frame. Action! The first important revelation of this precise reenactment is quite how close Roger and Bob were to the creature. They were right on top of it. Its behaviour wasn't unnatural, just walking away unconcerned. It was implausible. So, did you get it? Yeah, I mean, I did. Secondly, this is what we shot. At this distance, with this lens, you're certain to get the creature in the frame, unless you artificially shake the camera. Even so, it's difficult to see much detail in the suit, which is ideal. The whole thing, the location, the suit, the camera work, all gel into a beautifully crafted whole. There are loads of trendy, wobbly camera commercials in fashion now, but they always have an image that sells the product, like frame 352, the look back. I'm Bigfoot, buy me. And millions of people have. Like so many ex-creatures, Bigfoot is a fantastic legend from one of the world's last frontiers. I don't know who or what piled those rocks, or what all those eyewitnesses saw, but here's my case for the non-existence of Bigfoot as a real animal. There's a hell of a lot of space in America, but it's trampled all over. And in biological terms, there is absolutely no chance at all that there's an unknown species of giant apes stalking around California, or for that matter, Canada. You see, the Bigfoot phenomenon isn't based on good science. It rests upon one thing, the Patterson film, and that is a hoax. We've shown you just how easily it could have been done, and now Bob Gimlin has broken his silence and confessed that he's not entirely sure about what he saw in the first place. And to me, that is incredibly significant, because it's his word that has helped keep this hoax alive for more than 30 years. But now it's over. Bigfoot isn't dead because it was never alive, only in the minds of the dreamers and the schemers. But then, good on them. You know, if Roger Patterson were here today, I'd shake him by the hand. I'm not saying I'd load his camera, but I'd shake him by the hand. More of today's highlights from the Commonwealth Games on BBC Two now. But coming up here on BBC One, the woman who's agreed to have her neck broken to save her life. A story of courage in tomorrow's world. Thank <laughs> you.